goal, does it? Especially when it's beautifully played like that. Thank you, Brother Perkins, and uh, just um, it was such a blessing. All right. You have your notes tonight, perhaps. Uh, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes uh, this evening. We're going to continue on um, in our study from last week. We're going to be in chapter 7 uh, this evening, but I encourage you to maybe just keep your eye there in chapter 6 first. I'll give a little bit of a review um, based on what we talked about last week and then move forward to finish the thought. Um, I do know that it's been a week since we've been here, so I'm going to bring a little bit of up to speed here tonight and remind us, get us back kind of in the frame of mind of what we've been talking about. We're in the third discourse uh, that Solomon has written. We talked about the the secret of pleasure in the first discourse, how that there can be no enjoyment in pleasure of this earth. Um, and then we talked the second discourse was the secret of providence, how God will, uh, He has created within us a limitation to understand and a limitation to control what's around us. That's a design that God put and a part of our sin nature. So we can't control, we comprehend, we can't control things that are around us completely. And so that limitation is a goad for us. It's a reminder that we have to find our dependence, our enjoyment in God. Can I remind you tonight, the, uh, we, we've, we're all facing difficulties and burdens, and I'm thankful for how the Lord's working. But can I just tell you tonight, church, that God can give us enjoyment even in the midst of things that we can't control. It has to be. And the blessing is that no matter if it's a relationship or a physical problem or a financial difficulty or some unforeseen or uncontrollable circumstance around you, doesn't matter, God can still give the enjoyment factor in that problem. Um, and the opposite is true. If we have great prosperity and God's blessed us and right now we don't have all the burdens and cares, perhaps, you can find enjoyment in that, even though it's not that, it's God. So it, it, the, it's irrelevant what your condition is. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying everything's easy and everything's hunky-dory and we're going to be happy. What I'm saying is we can find meaning and joy at the very core of life if God is there. And then we talk to, uh, thirdly about the secret of prosperity. And that's tonight. He talks about um, that prosperity, letter A, isn't always good. We talked about that last week. Um, we would say that, man, if I just had more, um, I'd be better off. Um, and and I've, I feel like that many times. Lord, if I just had a little bit more um, things, if I just had a little nicer, if I just had a little bit easier, a little bit better, if it was a little different, Lord, it would be better. Mm -hmm. And the Lord is saying, that's not true. Um, you have what you need. Be content with such things as you are. You have, and so the idea to last week, really, in this matter of prosperity, is the idea of contentment. And we spent a lot of time talking about what contentment means and what the Bible says about it. We'll we'll talk more about it tonight as well. And uh, so we 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 wrote we read last week in verses six, uh, chapter six verses one through twelve that uh, <laughs> excuse me that Solomon points out that that oftentimes prosperity brings pain. It, it brings an emptiness. And uh, I just want to ask you tonight, get your mind engaged a little bit, can you think of any place else in the Scripture where the idea of, of prosperity or wealth or riches is uh, potentially something that's empty? Do you, do you, do any other verses come to mind about that? You may not know the reference. Um, can you think of anything like that, uh, Brother Phil? Yeah, yeah, that's... That's right, for he had many possessions, and he realized that that's, you know, what he had wasn't enough to enter the kingdom of heaven, and God had called him to, to change his perspective, and that was a big deal to him. That's good. I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, anybody else think of one, Brother, Brother Brian? Okay, yes, right. So the Bible says uh, that our, yeah, the money takes wings and flies away, right? Uh, that's good. Yes, sweetheart. Mm, yeah. That's right. So you could have blessing with sorrow uh, in the sense of if I bless myself or if it's some sort of man-made blessing, but the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. He doesn't have any sorrow with it. That's good. I'm thinking about, is it in Habakkuk? I think it's Habakkuk that talks about um, putting your money in a bag with holes, right? 
and uh, the idea there is that you know you can heap in, and, I, um, and yet you don't have what you need. Um, so the the prosperity many times, and we read right here in Ecclesiastes that when wealth is increased, they are increased that eat them. You know the idea is that the 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 moochers and the the leeches. You know, uh, not people necessarily, but that could be the case. But just the things of life. Um, will have a tendency to suck that away. And so the idea there is that pain often is found in prosperity. Um, and humanly speaking, more is not better, necessarily. Okay, that, It doesn't correlate, is what I'm saying. It can be, because God's at, in it, but so can less. What I'm saying is there can be pain in prosperity. He mentioned that. And um, I, I gave you several nails there. Contentment is better than prosperity. And also, you can't always know what is good for you. And I think that was the heart of the thing last week, is that you can't, and I can't know what's good for me, always, because I'm very limited in my understanding and my knowledge. And so God is the one that we trust in all of that. And then I gave you the principle of con- contentment, um, uh, or excuse me, um, yeah, contentment, discontentment, etc. there. Let's turn, if you would, to page 22. And um, I think we left off, I'm, I may be wrong, but let me give you letter E here. Um, I, and this goes back to letter D. We're still under the principle of contentment there where we're talking about what contentment really is. And I kind of quickly moved over letter B. Uh, let me go back there if I can and say that the scriptural teaching of contentment is that I need to be content with everything that I have. Let's, talk, let's look at a couple of these verses tonight that will help us to see that. And maybe I'll just um, I'll assign these in a little bit more of an informal way tonight. Obviously, Hebrews 13.5 is the key there. And Do I have someone that would be willing to read Hebrews 13.5? Just throw your hand up quickly. Uh, thank you, Nathan. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. There's several verses there. 1 Timothy 6, AJ, thank you. And um, Philippians 4, 11 and 12. Thank you, Mr. Jesse. All right, so find those, and I'll call on you here to read them. But the Scripture teaching is that we need to be satisfied. The word satisfied means filled, all right, contented with what we have. All right, Nathan, read Hebrews 13, 5, if you would, loudly. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay, so key, key verse there on contentment, right? And we've, we've dissected that a little bit. Be content with such things as you have. Why? Because He is all that we need. I will never leave thee. All right, so that's a very important concept there. All right, let's go to Brother AJ, 1 Timothy. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, Drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. We could spend a whole night on that phrase or on that passage, but you, you heard the very pointed truth. Now, don't misunderstand this. He's not saying that possessions are wrong, material things are wrong. What he's saying is the pursuit of them are flee the things that we would want to pursue uh, in our flesh. Why? Because God blesses. He's the one that gives. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things shall be added unto you. What I'm saying is that God makes it very clear that our pursuit ought to be righteousness. It ought to be holiness in our relationship with Him. That's not fun, Pastor. It's fun driving a new, you know, whatever, having this what and that, you know, doing this. I get it. I know that. And God will bless sometimes with that. But if He doesn't, are we content with what we have? That's the question. Can we find enjoyment in Him and not in our things? Um, That's the key. So, really, those those are the key things there. Don't be dissatisfied with clothes. Um, and, and you name it. What, what is it that you know you are dissatisfied with right now? Maybe you know um, not just maybe a material possession, but maybe it's myself, right? Or 
um, whatever. And we'll talk about this. There's a right kind of discontentment. I want to temper that. And I'll talk to you. The Bible tells us that. But I want you to see that God wants us to be content with Him. And that's the key. Let's read. Uh, go ahead and read Jesse Philippians there, chapter 4. So, yeah, praise the Lord. Paul was comfortable. I think the key there is, you know, obviously in the flesh you don't desire to be without. Um, but, but here's the bottom line. He was comfortable. He was content whether he had much or he had little. Um, if he was in a place where he, and there were times in his life, I'm sure he had more. He had, he had a quantity. Then there were times in his life he didn't have anything. And he was, he was absolutely suffering with nothing. But the Bible says he was, what was the key? He was content in either of those states. And I think that's really the spiritual lesson, the spiritual uh, concept here that we're talking about. And I'm spending some time on this because I want you to see that God is the key to happiness and fulfillment. That's what letter C says. Discontentment, then, comes from a faulty view of God. Can I say that again? At the very core of your covetousness and discontentment, and my covetousness and discontentment, is a faulty view of God. Why do you think God put in the first Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet? And he goes on to tell us some examples, the neighbor's things and all the you know things that neighbor has. Who's my neighbor? Anybody around you, right? So what makes me dissatisfied with the things that I have is a faulty thinking view that God is not being fair to me. He's not treating me the same as he's treating someone else. Or he's neglecting me in this situation. Or he's forgotten. Or he hasn't treated me fairly. So that's the, that's the bottom line. And can I tell you tonight, discontentment, as we've talked about this whole study, is that first step, what? On the cycle downward of wrong thinking that takes us into anxiety, depression, despair, and all those things. And, and I'm talking about spiritually, um, now, and I want you to understand that that's something that can be very, very dangerous. And so the Bible makes it clear here that we need to be thinking right about who God is. And uh, let's go then to letter E, um, and I'll, I'll just give you this quickly. And I mentioned this, that God sometimes uses discontentment to provide direction. And I want to tell you what I'm talking about here. We're not talking about a fleshly covetous discontentment we're talking about and i would classify this as what's called a burden all right now if you remember the book of acts i'm not going to turn there because of time but if you remember the book of acts there was a discontentment in the church specifically there were jews and the jews were being well taken care of for some reason the emphasis was on the jewish uh, widows and their needs but very specifically the part of the church now, remember there's a young church, they had just kind of formed and, and everything was just kind of getting started, much need in the church. People would sell what they had and bring their possessions or literally bring their money to the church and the church would distribute those things to the widows that were in need. And in that distribution, the daily distribution, whatever that was, the Jews were getting what they needed but the, the Gentiles, the Greeks, were not. And that was a problem. How many of you see that's a problem? <laughs> All right? It was just an oversight, I'm sure. I'm, I don't know if there was anything. The Bible doesn't lead us to believe there was anything, you know, intentional about that. It just was an oversight. Matter of fact, when they came, there was a, there was a discontentment among the Gentile segment of the church. Would you call that a discontentment? <laughs> There's a problem here. Our widows aren't being provided for. They come to the leadership. And they did right by saying, hey, we've got a burden here. This is something that's given us a little trouble. And so the leadership gets together and says, you, we need to seek out seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost who can do the work of the ministration daily and make sure that everybody's getting what they need. So it was recognized that this burden, discontentment, provided some direction. By the way, if you go back to the list of the disciples, excuse me, the deacons that were first chosen, and you look at all of them, with the exception of just a couple, they were Gentiles. And I'll tell you, because God used the people that I believe had maybe the burden, 
right? They had the burden to see something change, see something different. We want to make sure this happened. And the church says, well, you've got the burden. I think you guys are the ones qualified to take care of that. It's interesting. And so God uses sometimes that discontentment. I use the word burden. Discontentment about something that ought to be happening right. Not in a situation or with their life, but, but with this, is, something's not right here, to help to bring some direction to the church. And really, it was a blessing in that way. And so, and you could study that and see that I think that's really how the Lord used that time uh, to bring that. And, um, you know, God, God does all of that, and I'm thankful for that. And I think that's really the key. Sometimes I've had, you know, some of our folks come and say, Pastor, you know, I'm just burdened about this particular area, or maybe burdened that maybe the Lord would do this, or maybe whatever the direction is here, and it, it's just something that's slipped by or didn't, you know, hasn't been addressed. Listen, that's, I think, this way that God uses to help. Now, if you come and you're like, you know, you got the bad attitude about that's not I don't think that's the point the point is you come you've got a burden you've got something that's going on and let's let's pray and seek the Lord and many times God's directed us because of that and I'm thankful I think the Lord does that and so sometimes discontentment can be that way um, I remember when I was seeking the Lord um, direction especially with, with a change in my life with that burden of I think God's doing something often came and I'll use the word a divine discontentment with where I was. Not, not the location, but the, posi- or the, uh, the place in my Christian life. There was always an urge to do something more or better or different in the sense I think God's leading. My dad used to say it this way. When, when God is ready to move in our lives, many times he starts early on by making the nest uncomfortable. And I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And whatever that means and however that is, many times God will start making us a little uncomfortable, you know, at just about the time where we, it's about time to take that step of faith, we've gotten about as uncomfortable as we can be, and we're ready to take that step of faith and whatever that is. And I think that's a wonderful thing. God sometimes uses divine discontentment, but not in the fleshly sense, not in the material sense, not in the sense of, you know, I don't have what I want or make me happy. That's not what we're talking about. I think you guys are mature enough to know the difference in that. Num- letter F. Carnal discontentment, I, I already said this, but I'll give it to you as a note. Carnal discontentment is motivated by covetousness. It's motivated by covetousness. I, I want what I don't have, or I want what I see. Um, and that's a huge, huge issue, of course, Hebrews 13.5, letter G. A sign of discontentment is an if-only syndrome. Now, can I tell you, it never stops with if only. I think if only, and maybe you want to write this down in your notes, the phrase, and of course that's a generic phrase, but it's something like, if only I had, or if only this was different, if only I didn't have, whatever it might be, that is a sign of discontentment. But it never stays there. Then it goes into, listen carefully tonight, if it goes into the idea of what if. Now we're in a situation where my if only has degenerated into a what-if scenario, and that is really a sign of anxiety. What if something bad happens? What if there's a problem? What if I can't control this? What if there's whatever the case might be? And I think that's where we have to be careful. Because discontentment, if only, steps down into what if this happens, and then ultimately the last step is it doesn't matter anymore, right? I, uh, uh, or it, there's no hope in this whole situation. Maybe you could call it this way. What's the use? It's the idea of despair. Discontentment, anxiety about what's happening, what I can't control, what's, it, what's you know, outside of my hands, down to I just give up. What's the use? And, and that's that spiral down that we've talked about over and over again. And it's, I, I go back to it again. I cannot emphasize it enough. Discontentment is that first step. And it's a, it's a faulty view of who God is. So remember that. L- letter F. No, I just gave that. Letter H. Contentment isn't getting what you want, but it's enjoying what you have. And I, I think that's a key. Contentment isn't getting what you want, but enjoying what you have. And this is back to the key issue again of it being a gift from God. And if you look at what you have as a gift from God, my life, my, ho- my help, my my abilities, my opportunities, all of these things I have as a gift from God. If that is your mention, that's your mindset, 
then what's going to happen is you're going to be content with that which you have. And if God pleases to give more and whatever, that's a wonderful thing. We rejoice in that. But that's not our, that's not our uh, pursuit. All right, letter B. I said, first of all, that prosperity isn't always good. Letter B is obviously pain isn't always bad. That's the opposite side of it, right? And um, boy, that just hurts even say, doesn't it? We don't want pain of loss, pain of separation, pain of rejection, pain of want, pain of all kinds of stuff. We don't want that stuff. But can I tell you tonight, according to what we're going to learn, it's not always bad. All right, look at chapter 7. And you'll notice here, I've, I've um, marked in my Bible the key word better uh, as we go down through the passage here. And uh, he uses that quite a few times to differentiate between what we think is good and what God says is better. Did you hear that? What we think is good oftentimes falls way short of what God says is better. And I love the fact that he uses the word better talking about death. He uses the word better talking about lack of things and pain and reality. Something to that. Let's look at number one, verse number one. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, a good name is talking about a, repu a reputation here. And the idea of that good name being better than precious ointment is a, is a parallel to what he's just going to say there in the next phrase, the day of death is better than the day of one's birth. Now, that goes against what we're talking about every Sunday night. We say, so-and-so's having a birthday, let's sing to him. And we're having a birthday. Let's get together and eat cake and have a great time, give presents, and that's wonderful. We're celebrating the day of one's birth. But, Paul, but uh, Solomon says, it's better to celebrate the day of your death. It's kind of late when you die, right? But you know what's Maybe maybe we ought to look back at you know people who've gone before us and commemorate those days, and many of us do, loved ones and so forth. Why is that better? It's painful. We don't see them anymore. We don't have fellowship with them anymore. But, but the fact is, he says it's better. Why? Now, I'm not proposing we stop celebrating birthdays. I, I, I don't, you know, if, if that's something you do, that's great and that's wonderful. But the fact is, he's making a point here for us to understand and, and to understand what it means. So the key here is the emphasis on the idea that the prosperity of pain is the, is the result. In other words, what is pain bringing about? What is it producing in us? Isn't it terrible to go through pain? And I think we could all say, amen, pastor. Physical, emotional, mental pain, everything. It's difficult to go through that. None of us like that. It's painful. That's why it's called pain. But there, it, it'd be even worse if we went through that pain and we didn't have anything profitable at the other side of it. But the Bible teaches us that God, in His mercy, can even redeem pain and He can bring us out on the other side of it with fruit and with blessing, and it can be better than not having pain. Now, I just, I, I want to encourage you tonight in this. I've talked to people, and I know for a fact that people who've gone through the pain of disease and the pain of loss and the pain of other things, I've, had, I've heard testimony where they said, Pastor, it was difficult and it was hard, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Now, I, don't, I, don't, I can't understand that. Not in the context they're talking about, because I haven't experienced that. But I believe that's what the Bible's teaching. And so we look, number one, at the nail, not number one, but the nail number three there in our lesson. And it's found, as we continue on, it's better to go, verse number two, to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Literally, it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party. Why? Because the Bible says, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for the sadness of the countenance, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Okay, now, number one, or the nail there, number three, would you say it this way, funerals are better than rowdy parties. I'd, I'd rather go to a birthday party, Pastor. Yeah, I know, but that's not where the wise grow and learn. Um, 
Why? Because parties have a tendency to make us forget about what our life's all about. We have a great time. It's fun. Just forget about whatever. In the worldly sense, literally, they forget about it because they drink so much or whatever. And it's, you know, whatever. But the fact is, parties are fun. It's great. It's wonderful. Get together, have a good time, laugh, and do whatever you're going to do. Play games and eat food. And uh, you get done, and you come back, and life is still there. Okay? We don't, it doesn't cause us to think about life. Funerals, on the other hand, is the house of mourning causes us to think about those things. And that's good. That's good. I've often used that passage at funerals. It's good to be here today in this funeral. It's good to be looking not only at the deceased, but considering what our life is going to be and what our end is. That's a good thing. The wise will lay it to his heart. It's better. The fruit of that is better than the fruit of parties and forgetting. And it's a wonderful thing. So funerals are better than rowdy parties. Though painful they are, I understand. Number one, why? Because the day of, or the, the house of mourning, funerals, make you conscious of your reputation. That's verse number one we talked about there. Having a better name. Right? It's the idea of helping me to consider if I were laying in that box today, how am I going to be remembered? I, I, maybe you ask it this way. What are you going to have on your gravestone? Uh, do, you have, do you have your epitaph written? If you, if you had to die today and write your epitaph before you died, what would you write on it? I told you I was sick. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I know of one lady, she used to tell people that she would give out her chocolate chip recipes over her dead body, and literally they put her chocolate chip recipe on her gravestone. <laughs> it's a fact. Now, what I'm saying, what is, all of those, you know, hilarious, funny, what, but here's the point. What, what really do you want to be remembered by? Um, and I know we don't so much anymore write epitaphs. I, I regret that. Matter of fact, gravestones are going away now. Just, just burn me and put me in an urn and whatever. I, I think it's a grievous thing. I won't get into that tonight. But the fact is, you know, we have an opportunity. How will we, we be remembered? Mm. Last week on Friday, we went to the funeral of Pastor Barth's dad, Brother Don Barth. Had a big impact in my life personally, our family. Mm -hmm. For years labored with him and his family, and just they've invested in us as a family, and, and even younger, and so forth and so on. I can't go on. But, you know, just the idea of sitting and listening, it was an overwhelming, resounding testimony of a person who knew God, and who was a good, he was a good person serving the Lord. I mean, just, you just couldn't get away from it, no matter what. In his family, in his professional life, his spiritual life in church, all, all the same. It was, whether it was his kids or his church members or his family or friends, neighbors, relatives, it, all, everybody said the same thing. You know, Solomon is saying, that man died better off, not just because he had all that, but literally for eternity's sake, than all the birthdays he could have celebrated and, and just having a great life. Why? Because a good name is better. And, and that's what he's talking about. Funerals help us to consider how will you be remembered? Well, I just, nobody knows me. And I'm not saying significant. I'm part of the theme that day in the funeral was, you know, in the scope of human greatness, Don Barth didn't do anything to get his name on any kind of who's who list or plaque or award or any, I mean, I'm sure he had awards, whatever. But, but nobody in the world would look at him and say he was a great man. Because the greatness, as was said, was in God's eyes. And, and I think that's the whole point. When we value those things being great in God's eyes, yeah, the world, and by the way, God used many godly people to be good and important in the world's eyes. Remember Daniel? He was second in command, or third in command, of all of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's empire, I mean, God used him as the prime minister there, and I don't think we realize how big of a job that is, how big of an influence that was. Joseph. Okay, I, what I'm saying is God does promote people to greatness in the world's eyes, but that's not the same as greatness in God's eyes. And so the, the idea there is that funerals help us to look at our reputation 
and understand that. Um, by the way, at birth, everybody starts with the same reputation. Do you think about that? These little babies born, cute, lovely, wonderful, they're a blank slate when it comes to their reputation. Now the decisions they make and the directions that they take and all of those things in life build a reputation which we're all living and building right now. As a young child, you're building your reputation. As an older, uh, middle age, whatever, older, you're refining that reputation. We're always building our reputation. And it's never too late to change that, but funerals help us to consider those things. Number two, funerals make us conscious of our reality. And we read that um, it's better to go in the house of mourning, the house of feasting, feasting the, uh, the living will lay it to his heart, etc. I won't spend a lot of time talking about that other than underneath there. Look at a wise man will react to death by reflecting. You know, uh, the world today, you can't find a funeral service hardly. And I'm not being sarcastic or, or uh, cynical. I'm being reality. Here's, here's how I judge that. My mom, for years, has been contracted by a local funeral parlor, funeral home, when the family doesn't have anybody to play music, they'll have her play the piano or the organ for the family, you know, whatever the service is, either before, or after, during, whatever. And, uh, you know, obviously COVID had an impact on a lot of things, changed people's minds. But the statistics of what she used to play, just in that one or two nursing, or uh, funeral home, excuse me, um, and the statistics have absolutely just plummeted. Whereas she would get four or five in a week funerals now they say we, we're hardly able to get any funerals and there, people are dying but they're not having memorial services uh, and and people aren't doing this they're not having services they're not having they're just you know whatever this little thing is and family gets this we're not having anything or we'll have a little thing at my house or a little party or whatever and, and I'm not criticizing other than to say it's a symptom of the world we live in who don't want to face the realities of death it's too painful it's too uncomfortable. I don't want to deal with it. And so let's just ignore it. And rather than having a, a, a service where we can honor the dead and reflect upon our own lives, that's uncomfortable. I want to do that. Now we're just going to kind of party instead. Okay, now, I'm, I'm not sitting here criticizing the world. Of course, they don't have any hope. I don't expect anything else. But Christians, we need to understand that it's good for us to reflect in these things. Yes, it's hard and difficult. And, and yes, we want to comfort the family who's lost. But Solomon is saying here that the house of mourning is a good place because people who are wise, and, and we could say it, not being critical, but just observing, the world is not getting wiser. We're, we're getting more technologically advanced. Knowledge is increasing, whatever. But we're not getting wiser. And, and the wise will lay it to their heart. It's a good thing. So I would just challenge us in this way as a Christian, let's buck the trends of the, of the uh, culture. Let's buck the trends of, of where the world's going, and, and let's be true to what God wants us to do. And part of that is, you know, reflecting on, on the life that God's given to us and the life that was now no longer here on this earth, and, and that's a good thing. And so it's important for us to remember this as we look into it here, the reality of it. it, it wise men will react to death by reflecting, but a fool will react by reveling. And this is just what I said. Instead of reflecting, let's just party and forget it. You know, and I, I've been a part of memorials that are just like, they would have wanted us to be happy. And yes, uh, maybe that's true. And so, you know, let's go have a party. And I understand the heart. I'm not criticizing. I'm not being unkind. I, I really do understand. But I am saying tonight that Paul, I keep saying Paul, Solomon tells us that it's, it's wise that lay it to heart and fools that just try to revel it away and ignore it. And so just consider that. And pain isn't always bad. It's not bad to have pain because it brings forth fruit when God is dealing with it. And then that's nail number four here. Um, and, and look at verses five through six, and I'll give you that. It is better, there's our word again, better, to hear the rebuke of the wise. Okay, here's another, another nail. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools Wow, um, can I, well, let's go to verse 6. Four, okay, so he's going to back up what he just said with some, with some truth here. The crackling of the thorns, or as the crackling of the thorns under a pot, 
so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Take a minute and just assimilate those two verses. Let me, let me say verse 5 again. It's better to hear rebuke from the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. I, I want to stop here and say this, that if, if there is a, uh, something to be learned here about music, there is a song of fools. Okay, I'm not going to go into that, but there is a song of fools. What's the song of fools? It is, I believe, the song, number one, that doesn't lead us to truth, right? It doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't have any value when it comes to edification and encouragement. It's simply just noise, which I, I, I didn't plan to preach on this tonight, but, you know, the, the world's music, and young people, you need to listen to me tonight, the world's music is, is absolute vanity. We can talk about the, the nature of, of the music itself, but I want to just focus tonight on the lack of substance in the words and in the meaning of these things. And I think that's the key for us to remember in context what we're talking about. There is absolutely no value in that whatsoever. Matter of fact, he goes on and says in verse number 6, the crackling of thorns under a pot. Now, how many of you know, maybe I don't know how many of you burn fires and so forth with brush, but the idea of thorns is you get a real quick like crackle, snap, pop, and it's really kind of big and everything, but there's no heat and no value. It's there and gone. I mean, it, am I describing that right? I mean, maybe we could think of other ways to describe it, but I, it's kind of satisfying. You get this big bramble bush, you know, and it's like, oh, it's all this stuff, and you put it on the fire, and it's like, and in a matter of just a minute or two, it's all gone. And it gets, maybe it gets real hot for a minute, and it's, it's just gone. There's no substance to it. And you contrast that to a good old, big old oak or maple log that you put on the fire, good hot fire. Man, I think it'll just burn all night long or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's just, a, it's just a steady kind of flow. There's a picture there you need to understand. And that cackling or, or the crackling of the fool of the thorns is likened unto the laughter of, of the fools. And I'm not talking about somebody who just goes around and you know, laughs weirdly. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who instead of being serious and consider what's the truth of this, what is the pain going to produce in my life, they're just interested in laughing it off and trying to ignore it. And you know what I'm talking about, getting out from underneath it and, 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 and trying to ease the pain of it rather than going to the source who can help us. And that's the Lord Jesus, God himself. And so the idea is, is just vanity. And it's better, the Bible says there, to hear the rebuke of the, of the wise. Now, let me go back to that phrase and say that the rebuke of the wise is better, nail number four here in your notes, it's painful but it's better than the entertainment of fools. All right, so let me widen my application tonight. Christians were fallen into the same trap as the world when it comes to salving the pain that we're going through. And here's what we do. We fall into the trap that says, man, it's been a painful day. It's been a hard time. It's been a, I've been lonely or you name it. Whatever the pain is, physical, emotional, psychological, whatever. You just name whatever the pain is. And what we do is we try to entertain that pain away rather than hearing the rebuke of the wise. Now, you say, Pastor, it sounds like when I'm in pain, I kind of have to become a monk or a nun and just kind of, you know, meditate. Until I... No, obviously, that's not what I'm talking about. But the idea there is learn and, and be patient and bear up and go to the person who can bring you the prosperity in that pain. Um, nobody wants to go there. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us that it's not, they're, they're for a moment, they're for a season. No pain is permanent, even if it's our whole life. It's not permanent. We will not have that in heaven, praise the Lord. But, but there's a season of that, and you say, man, I don't want that. No, nobody does, but there is a, there is a prosperity in that. Sometimes pain can be better then prosperity. And I want to encourage you that that's the truth that we're talking about tonight in this. Notice uh, verse number 7 of chapter 9 of Proverbs there in your notes. Proverbs 9, 7. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. In other words, you try to rebuke somebody who's not willing to take it, and you become the bad guy. You become the one who's shame. Isn't that terrible? 
but that's what happens. By the way, don't be that person. Don't, re don't uh, reject, rebuke, or uh, reproof that's coming. Verse 8, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. How do I know if I'm wise or fool? Well, how do you receive rebuke? If, if you love the one who brought the rebuke, the Bible says that's a wise person. If you, if you don't, you scorn the, the person who brought you the rebuke, that's the heart of a fool. Then it goes on, uh, give instruction to a wise man, he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, he will increase in learning. And then we go on. Um, this is kind of a, uh, I would say maybe just a kind of a paraphrase perhaps of that or commentary on this. A mocker who is wicked is unteachable. When someone corrects him, he responds in an attitude of hatred by lashing out with insulting verbal abuses. When corrected, a wicked person hurls back a rebuke by defaming his would-be counselor or in somehow making a, an excuse for what they've done rather than receiving it. Such a mocker is hardened in his ways. On the other hand, a wise person appreciates rebuke because he learns from it. He gets rebuke and he's made wiser. Rebukes can be helpful to the one who is willing to learn from them. And there's many verses in Proverbs. You can read those and study those on your time there. By being teachable, one becomes wiser. As anywhere in Proverbs, or elsewhere in Proverbs, a wise person is a righteous person. Godly character should underlie one's mental sagacity. What that simply means is, as I'm a walking with the Lord and I desire to be wise, God will make me wiser. And as I'm re receiving rebuke and instruction and reproof and, and correction, and I get those things and I receive them humbly, they will produce great fruit in me. So the idea there is that reproof and rebuke, though painful, nobody likes that. Kids, you don't like when your parents correct you and instruct you and reprove you. You bristle like we do as adults. But I'm saying if you can learn to humble yourself and take that rebuke with with wisdom, the Bible says you will blossom into that wise person. You will do that. Now, adults, may we be good in, uh, examples of that. Man, I think sometimes we're, we're the hardest ones many times to receive rebuke and instruction and correction. The hardest ones. So important that we understand that. Let me give you nail number five. All right, look at verse seven. Through ten, surely oppression maketh the wise man mad. Mad there simply means you know, kind of out of his mind. It not, it's not making sense. Oppression, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Verse 10, say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. All right, so the nail number five then, we talked about that a funeral is better, though more painful, than a party. We said that reproof, though painful, is better than entertainment. Now we're saying that patience, though painful, is better than than angry revenge. So the idea there is that I, it's painful to sit back and wait and know that there are things going on that are hard and difficult and unfair, and, and it's hard to stand back and say, I've been misjudged, I've been mis misunderstood, or this is a misunderstood thing. It's hard to stand back and, and not take some revenge on that. Would you agree with me on that? Man, how many of us want to go out and do something or make it right or justify or whatever. The Bible says it's harder to have patience, but it's better. And this is the secret that we're talking about in pain. Pain isn't always bad, and prosperity isn't always good. We can um, see there Romans chapter seven of 12, 12, verses 17 21, when it talks about overcoming evil with good. And that's a great way for us to learn. Boy, if we're talking about our relationships as husbands and wives or brothers and sisters or co-workers, overcome evil with good. 
All right, so the conclusion here I think is very important. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said this. He said, don't judge what you see by what you see. I know it's Wednesday night, but get a hold of this. He was the king of these. Don't judge what you see by what you see. Judge what you see by what the Bible says about what you see. Did you get that? In other words, the lens of logic and understanding that you need to filter everything through is God's Word. And what His logic, what His truth is, that's what it needs to be. So it's not, oh, I see that. This is, it doesn't make sense, or it's unjust, or it's good, or it's bad. No, it's not about what we see. It's about what God says about what we see. So if I say, well, what I see seems to be good, but God's Word says it's empty, we have a choice to make there, don't we? (laughs) Who are you going to believe? That's the whole point. And I'll tell you, life, hear me, and I'm done. Life is made up of coming to those points of decision. Who am I going to believe? What I see or what the Bible says about what I see? And going what direction? And I'll tell you, that's what your life is made up of. Those minute choices daily, how you value things, how, how you listen to things, what you value in life, those, that's what your life is made up of. So church, the fact of the matter is, I think Solomon is being, obviously, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, very clear on this idea that we can have prosperity, but not in the way we think. Now, if God blesses you with material things, that's wonderful. If God doesn't bless you with material things, that's wonderful. If God blesses you with health, that's wonderful. If God doesn't bless you with health, it's wonderful. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm saying God can be the enjoyment factor in all of those things. May God help us to have that spirit tonight. And so we've learned tonight then about the um, secret of prosperity. And I trust that you'll take those lessons and, and keep them hard in your heart. God would teach us. Shall we pray together? Lord, thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your grace and your love. And uh, Lord, I'm thankful that we can uh, put some words to these uh, truths as we study the book of Ecclesiastes, Lord, how it's helped me in my perspective. Uh, Lord, even in, in talking to others, Lord, it's so easy to see why they're in desperate situations, why I'm in a desperate situation. And, and in not only why, but how I can respond and what I need to uh, react like in that situation. And uh, Lord, when there's times in my life when I feel lost or empty, Lord, it's because I'm not following hard after you. And and Lord, I've lost my focus that you are the enjoyment factor. And I pray that you would help, Lord, us to just, um, as we meditate on this, then to find, Lord, that wisdom that is guiding us and directing us in our relationship with you. And so, Lord, uh, thank you again for your grace and goodness. Uh, Continue to teach us what we need to learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.